My studio guest tonight is Dr. Rakesh Mohanlal. He's a doctor of clinical technology specializing in cardiovascular perfusion and non-invasive medicine. He completed his master's research through the Durban University of Technology and became the first perfusionist to attain a doctorate in this field after his master's was converted into a doctorate. I mean, it was that good. Now, we've had him on before, so uh, if you missed out, uh, let me tell you a bit more about Dr. Mohanlal. He holds close to 25 years of experience in the field. He's trained in South Africa, Saudi Arabia and the Netherlands and has been a guest speaker nationally and internationally at conferences. Dr. Mohanlal houses the only non-invasive diagnostic device on the African continent that is used for early detection and management of coronary artery disease and is the chief executive officer of the South African External Counterpulsation or ECP. Uh, Dr. Mohanlal, welcome back to Lotus FM. It's my third time that I get to say that in almost five years. So good to see you. Keeping well? Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. And good evening to the viewers. And uh, good evening to Maya. Um, I've been doing very well. Thank you. All right. Well, you know, you're looking good. Uh, before we get into tonight's topic, which is about uh, cholesterol, and we're talking about cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, I just mentioned the news around Sir Alex Ferguson and he had the, uh, the hemorrhage. Um, because, you know, hemorrhage, aneurysm, stroke, is it all part of the same family? Well, yeah, it is all cardiovascular diseases and uh, it's based on the vascular system malfunctioning to a degree that causes this. So what would be some of the, you know, the reasons, causes, is, could it be stress? In this case, you know, they said subarachnoid hemorrhage, could be hypertension, smoking, those are some of the... Uh, the profiles or risk factors that increase uh, your propensity for it? Well, and that's some of the risk factors. Others would be genetic uh, um, dispositions. Basically, patients whose parents have the same problem would, would inherit this in their genes. Uh, other things would be basically, why, why do we say stress is bad? I mean, uh, the older patients or people would tell us all the time, don't stress, um, it's unhealthy for you. What is meant by that? Because what does stress do, uh, do to, to an individual or what does it do to your body in, in, in general is that it con constricts all your blood vessels. And because it constricts your blood vessels, it remains constricted until you de-stress. Now, most of us in our life don't have a chance to de-stress. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Mr. Ferguson is a person who is highly strong because of the type of job he does. So by him stressing, he'll cause the blood vessels to constrict not dilate again. And this happening on a chronic basis would cause something called arteriosclerosis which is loss of elasticity of the blood vessels. That would basically back pressure the brain and that pressure in the brain actually caused the blood vessel to rupture. This is the way it actually causes homeostasis all, all, all over again, provided the person doesn't die after it. So high blood pressure once again, you know, and we've spoken about this, I've had previous medical specialists in the chair you're in tonight, you know, speaking about the dangers of uncontrolled hypertension. So, you know, that could be one of the reasons here then. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that could be one of the reasons. But as I was saying, um, hypertension can be measured using a blood pressure machine. Right. And <clears throat> it's misunderstood which state, which phase of a person's life we are recording at that, at that time when we take the reading. For example, if a patient had to be normal, for example, oh, the word normal would be yeah. a person at his young age. So what is normal? Not have though? hypertension. Well, we're looking at blood pressure. If you're looking at a, a reading yeah. of 120, 80, for example. Right. That's provided the patient is still in good physical condition. As the patient has problems, the blood pressure increases. And as the blood pressure increases, the body does things to change itself in order to regain its homeostasis. And when it does that, it either damages the blood vessel or damages the heart. And this actually causes the blood pressure to come down again. And this is the body's way of surviving, basically. Okay, well, tonight we're talking about cholesterol, we're talking about statins, uh, we'll talk about cardiovascular disease, and uh, we've also got some groundbreaking stuff that uh, uh, Dr. Mohanlal has researched and is going to be sharing with you and I tonight regarding some of the causes of, uh, of heart disease. We'll open up the lines, we're just going to take a limited number of calls because there's so much to talk uh, to Dr. Mohanlal. So if you uh, want to chat about cholesterol, about statins, or about heart disease, tonight's uh, the night for you to pick up the phone. Maya Jagjeevan Kalicharan, who's uh, our producer, she'll man our telephone lines on 08 0893108789 0893108789 that's the number to dial the first calls we receive will be the first calls we get back to uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes time i said we'll just take a handful on 0893108789 i'll also open up the whatsapp line for you tonight and here's the whatsapp number 0716137803 that's 0716137803 
0614-613-7803. And no calls on the WhatsApp line, please. We won't be able to take the calls there. It's just your, your regular text messages on WhatsApp. 071-613-7803. Or you can dial Maya. She's waiting for your call right now on 089-310-8789. Cholesterol, statins, cardiovascular disease with our studio guest tonight is a doctor of clinical technology specializing in cardiovascular perfusion and non-invasive medicine. His name is Dr. Rakesh Mohanlal. So he's here till 8 o'clock. So, uh, Dr. Mohanlal, since you were last with us, the statistics, of course, have been revised. And we're seeing this huge increase in things like uh, patients who are suffering with hypertension, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, exploding on a global scale, not just in South Africa. Uh, and before we get into the discussion regarding our heart, let's just quickly look at some of the stats to understand why it's so important to be talking about heart disease tonight. NCDs or non-communicable disease is a collective term for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, chronic respiratory disease and mental disorders. Uh, according to the stats, Dr. Manlal, they are the leading cause of death worldwide. Now, non-communicable diseases cause around 60% of the world's deaths, uh, 80% of which occur in developing countries like South Africa. So we certainly have our challenges. Cardiovascular disease, and this is where you come in, which includes heart disease and stroke, uh, is the leading cause of death and disability in South Africa after HIV and AIDS. It is responsible for almost one in six deaths in our country, claiming more lives than all cancers combined. Every day, 225 South Africans die from heart disease and stroke. Let me repeat that. Every day, 225 South Africans die from heart disease and stroke. Now, these are the latest statistics from the Heart and Stroke Foundation of South Africa. And today we're discussing cholesterol. Is it the true cause of heart disease? Dr. Mohanlal, I mean, is, is it as simple as that? Is cholesterol the true cause of heart disease? Yeah, I mean, if it was and we have all these um, medications that can control cholesterol, then our stats won't be so high. Because mm. not only in South Africa, it's even in the first world countries that heart disease is one of the greatest uh, causes of death. So why the high burden of cardiovascular disease in South Africa? Well, basically, we are following what we've learned from the first world countries right. and we use the same regimen. It, it makes no sense to follow a country that has a high level or incidence of heart disease and follow their regimen to control our system instead of following a, a, a system like, for example, we're following the American system, for example. Um, they have the highest incidence of heart disease. And yet we follow their system to see how we can prevent it. So we should, Whereas be, fo we should be following somebody like somebody like Japan. You mean they have lower incidence the lower of incidence of heart disease wouldn't that make more sense how, how can you go to somebody who's overweight to be your instructor to help you to lose weight so it's a good point you're making um you know and i and i, I can see the rationale behind that uh so why not then so why aren't we looking at japan based on your example and we're focusing on the u.s yeah because medicine is primarily based on fixing things it's not based on preventing the new pattern of thought should be geared more towards prevention and early detention instead of repairing what's broken. I mean, would you prefer your child grow up and then fix himself up by some one of these doctors or would you, prefer, would you prefer your child learning how to live so he doesn't need to be repaired in the first place? So some patients uh, and one or two are friends of mine uh, are on statins um, as a preventative. Okay, that makes absolutely no sense because the drug wasn't designed as a preventative. And I think uh, people need to understand what cholesterol is first yeah. and to understand what statins we're supposed to do and meant to do and what they can do and the side effects of the statins. A lot of people talk about Indian foods as a taboo when it comes to cholesterol and that, that's a sad uh, fallacy because Indian foods are some of the healthiest foods you can get. And the understanding behind it is that we never understood why our mums and our grandmums have put things into the food. So mutton curry with big aloos and roti makes absolute sense, provided it's it's prepared in the right fashion. You know, we've never asked ourselves simple questions. Why is garlic put into our food? Why is ginger put into our food? Turmeric. Why is turmeric put into our food? Yeah. Um, all these things like onions, chilies, they have medicinal benefits. Now, if whoever taught us to use it told us that we should take it in certain proportions every day in a teaspoon, we wouldn't. So what they did was literally put it into the food, ask your mom to braise it and feed it to us. Okay, what about carbs then? Carbohydrates have come in for a lot of headlines. That's uh, really true. We've had things like, you know, the Banting diet or low carb and the paleo diet, all kind of limiting <laughs> or restricting your intake of carbohydrates. I, I think it's to understand what's the, what's the negative aspects of carbohydrates. I mean, our parents and forefathers have been taking that for years and, and they didn't have that high incidence of heart problems. It's not the carbs that's a problem. 
it's the the the, the produce that's fed to us so the refined so carbohydrates the, yeah so actually what's happening is today the wheat for example we are modifying it and because we modify it it's not the same genetic material and same genetic structure as what your forefathers ate and because of that it reacts completely differently when in your body because it's been modified it's not a natural product anymore so i've had one of your colleagues in studio tell me we should not be eating you know the so-called chopped bread or the refined uh, wheat bread that we get we should not be consuming breakfast cereals uh, you know because it's really stripped wheat uh, packed with sugar uh, all of this uh, and and yes that's true to a degree but uh, alan i mean makes it very hard because everybody tells us what not to have and nobody actually tells us what we should be having and that's where we should be gearing our, our future. Okay, so then to combat lifestyle diseases, uh, there needs to be some type of change, right? We can't continue on this track, Dr. Monla. No, that's true. But first, we need to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. For example, we talk about cholesterol. Now, what is cholesterol? Cholesterol forms under a group of fats called, uh, that will go under lipids. So there's different types of lipids. Cholesterol is one of them. Triglycerides is another. And phospholipids is another. Okay. So when you talk about cholesterol, cholesterol is very important element in your body and it's used in steroid hormone production, bile acid production, and it maintains the integrity of cells, whereas things like uh, triglyceride would transfer energy to your cells in order to be used at any given stage of your life. And then we get phospholipids which forms uh, and maintains the integrity of the cell membrane. So these fats are very, very important to you and one would say, okay, 75% of the cholesterol is manufactured by your liver. Only 25% is coming from heterogenic cholesterol. What happens is when we move away from heterogenic cholesterol, your body is forced to produce the cholesterol on its own. So moving away from fats, like what you see, um, okay, the idea of the Banting diet to go more onto fats, and it actually decreases the cholesterol level, is because your liver realizes that you're now taking the fats from an external source. So because you're taking it from an external source, it would not produce cholesterol in such high levels anymore. And then the question is, why is cholesterol in the body in the first place? Like I said the last time I was on the show, nothing in your body is made for no reason. You, you remember I used the analogy of, of your perspiration? Mm. Even that's used as a protective coating. So what's the purpose then? Cholesterol, as, as, as entering on its own, is used for repairing cells. It's used for producing cells. It use, it's used for actually allowing the synapses to fire. It's used for the myelin sheet in your brain to actually protect your brain to allow it to function properly. So these things are stripped away by medication. And what happens is by us manipulating the system to create some sort of, of uh, figure that we want that's acceptable by some so-called experts, we actually put the body in a very, very negative uh, perspective. So what's this, you know, LDL, HDL, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, what's your take on it? Well, as I said before, there's no good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. <clears throat> Excuse me. The body produces the cholesterol in the liver. Cholesterol circulates in your bloodstream. The body then uses whatever cholesterol it requires. Whatever is not used up is taken by your HDL. So where, what, what is the carrier mechanism? The carrier mechanism is your LDL. So your, your LDL is basically your transport mechanism. It's not the cholesterol itself. So it's transporting cholesterol to the cells. And your HDL then brings back the cholesterol that's not used to the liver to produce bile. Now when that happens, basically, we say that the HDL is a good cholesterol because it removes the cholesterol and brings it back to the liver. And the LDL is a bad cholesterol because it transports cholesterol throughout the body. Now why would your cholesterol or your LDL increases? Your LDL would increase if the amount of cholesterol that your body is taking in is decreased. So then your LDL will grab onto any bit of cholesterol that it has to transport to the cells that require it. So this is a misconception that LDL is a bad cholesterol. So would you say total cholesterol and LDL markers on their own are not considered meaningless? Well, it's uh, meaningless to a degree. I mean, if you, you look at how we've changed uh, the figures, uh, a group of people got together at one stage and said it should no more be seven. Now, five millimoles is uh, sufficient for, for a patient to be put onto statins. But both go up, Dr. Monlal, when good HDL goes up, right? And mm -hmm. LDL particle size get large on, especially when you're looking at uh, something. And let's take, you know, we mentioned uh, the low-carb, healthy-fat diet that uh, seemingly reverses metabolic syndrome diseases like type 2 diabetes. If all mm -hmm. of a sudden you just chop. Uh, carbohydrates and you remove sugars from your diet you know if you're a type 2 diabetic the research is showing that you can reverse there the symptoms is. of diabetes no that's very true because you, you you what you're doing is basically you're dropping the carbs which are increasing your sugars so why do you need to control the amount of sugar that's circulating in your bloodstream 
if your intake is less. So all you're doing is basically you're decreasing the amount of carbs you're taking in. That would decrease the amount of circulating sugar. That would decrease the amount of need for any medication like insulin or, or other medication that control your, your sugar levels. So Dr. Mohanlal, let's take the example I, I just cited. If someone has this you know, high cholesterol, right, in <laughs> inverted commas, because you said, you know, there's no good or bad cholesterol, but let's just say high cholesterol, um, and which they could be vastly healthier than those patients who are on what is the standard government prescribed guideline food pyramid, right, with a high carb, um, you know, and then you need to eat wheat and maize and all of that, and you've had to give it up. Uh, you could still be in a, in a better position if you have high cholesterol. Well, most of the studies show that as you get older, high cholesterol it actually has a very protective uh, property on your brain and on your cardiovascular system. Okay. So contrary to the studies that we've, we've been fed by the industry, uh, we know that cholesterol does a lot of good in the body. But is high cholesterol a problem? Well, well what do we mean by high? Uh, I mean, if it's something like 16 or 17 or 18, then, then that's high. Then it's something that needs to be controlled. What it should but be? But if it's, if, if it's something like 0. Uh, 0. 0.5, I've seen patients that the cholesterol is supposed to be in the range of below 5 and they are 5.01, they've been put on statins for 0. 0.1 above the range. All right. So uh, we've mentioned that word a few times tonight, statins. I'm going to uh, get Dr. Mohanlal's take on it in a short while. Uh, we're going to go to the lines. You've got a first couple of calls lined up. We've also got a question coming through on the WhatsApp line. So let's go to Shireen in Durban who's holding on. Uh, evening, Shireen. How are you? I'm very well, Alan. How are you? I'm well. Nice to hear from you, my dear. Yes. I'd like to speak to the doctor there. Yeah, go ahead. Good evening. Uh, doctor, what numbers cholesterol be? What reading? Six, five, seven? I think that's what we're going to shed light on today, ma'am, because um, what we've been fed by industry is one thing and what we understand from our studies today is something completely different. So, Because my mind is sitting always at 5, now for this 3 months it's on 6.2, 6.1, so not going over that. I mean, the last reading was 6.5. There's only one patient or person that cholesterol would stay constant mm -hmm. and would stay absolutely the same every day, and that's the person who's dead, basically. So if you're living, it's going to be fluctuating? It should, because you're not doing the same thing every day. You're uh, not eating the same food every day. You're not, okay. So it has to fluctuate. So Shireen, what's your doctor saying? I mean, clearly it's worrying you. And have you had a chance? No, it's not worrying me. I'm worrying myself. Doctor said not to worry. Yeah. So this, uh, you know, moderate everything that you eat, fatty foods and a lot of oils and all that. Uh, so what are you eating? What you had for dinner tonight, Shireen? Oh, I had vegetables. This I'm fasting today. <laughs> right. Okay. And uh, uh, lunch today? Um, veggie. You're fasting then. What yeah. type of veggies? Uh, today I had graham doll with uh, calabash. Mm -hmm. And lunchtime I had the herbs with some doll. And well, that's rice. good for you. Okay. <laughs> but you know, I, I think amongst the Indians, the only one negative aspect about the way we cook is that we literally kill our veg. Yeah. You know, we, we overcook it. Green beans, that's brown and cabbage that's brown and all our veg turn out brown so this is the only negative aspect about the way we cook but otherwise i i have no problems with the way we cook final question oh. for you shireen uh, are you on a statin no okay so um you seemingly happy with the way you are at the moment yes i'm asking the doctor if it's six or five or six or five it's what fine i think your, your doctor has given you uh, sound advice not oh, to okay. worry too much about it now yeah. and as you say you've made some lifestyle changes and hopefully mm -hmm. that will help you Nah, thank you. Okay, right Shireen, take care, okay. my dear. Nice to hear from you. Bye-bye. Bye. That's Shireen in Durban. Mrs. Governor in Valbadach. Good evening, Mrs. Governor. Good evening, Helen, and thank you very much. Always uh, lovely topics, and good evening to our doctor. Doctor, uh, I'd like to know um, one of the symptoms will... Uh, um, having high cholesterol give off burning chest? Do you experience... Uh, good evening, sorry, ma'am. Uh, so basically <laughs> what you experience is your chest burning currently. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, there are other questions also. Mm -hmm. uh, taking in vitamin D, um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, residue cause cholesterol uh, level to go high, and and um, gallstones are they caused to um, you know uh, high level of cholesterol uh, on your gallbladder? Well, to answer your first question, you, you asked about the burning chest. The burning chest can be it can be coming from various different reasons. One can be decreased cardiac blood flow uh, coming from some sort of cardiac problem. The other can be where your blood pressure is not controlled and causes back pressure on your heart. The third can be gastric reflux, uh, which is common with people and especially with oily foods. Um, 
the foods are not he- unhealthy, but it would cause gastric reflux if there's too much of oil in it. So you have to identify which 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 one of those uh, anomalies is causing the chest to burn. Uh, secondly, um, your second question was about gallstones. Am I, am I right? Hello. Yeah, your second question was about gallstones, and you were asking yes. about does it affect the, your cholesterol? Yeah. Uh, does the vitamin D if we uh, when we take calcium and we uh, don't take the vitamin D, I think, here, yeah. mm-hmm. no, uh, coliferous, coliferous or coliferous okay. oil would then. What, what, your, body, what you know, your doctor is doing basically by giving you vitamin C and giving you vitamin D with it is just helping you with the uptake. Uh, in order for vitamin C to be effectively taken up in the body, it needs vitamin D. And vitamin D is very important as it's synthesized by cholesterol itself. So it's something that you can easily get from the sun. Because oh, yeah. yeah, your, your, your cholesterol would produce vitamin D and it would also uh, produce sulfate. Now, cholesterol is transferred in the body and used up when cholesterol bonds with sulfate to form cholesterol sulfate. So, okay. if your doctor has suggested that to you, he's basically looking at absorption and that's why he's given it to you. Mr. Governor, make sure you go and check out this uh, burning sensation so you put your mind at ease and we know it's nothing serious, okay? No oily food. I don't have oily food. Yeah. No margarines and... I'm not even talking with... about that. I'm talking about this burning sensation you have in your chest. To identify where yes. it's coming from. So, yeah. basically, I think what Ellen is trying to say is that you should look at some medical professional to help you in terms of identifying the cause, whether it's okay. actually your heart that's causing that or it's some small thing that that you can negate. Okay. Okay, Mrs. Governor. Take care. Good luck. Bye bye. Let's take our final call tonight. Uh, then we go to the WhatsApp line. It's uh, Jacqueline in Durban. Evening, Jackie. Hi there. I'd like to make a comment more than a, a, a question that sure. Doctor could elaborate. Okay. Um, I was going to the regular clinic and um, just can uh, clicks whatever and having my cholesterol checked and it was going higher and higher and the more i was trying to eat properly every time i went it was high and the end result i discovered that when they squeeze your finger to get the blood out it's level which makes the reading completely wrong okay just so, just repeat that because we lost the signal at a very crucial point there jacqueline so when they put your finger they should not squeeze it if they squeeze your finger to get the drop of blood out it increases the serum level which makes the cholesterol reading inaccurate maybe doctor can okay. elaborate that on that thank okay. you uh, jackie before we say goodbye to you uh, what was the reading if you don't mind sharing that with the doctor i ended up with 7.9 okay and then when i had a proper blood test it was within normal limits all right okay thanks jacqueline appreciate the question Bye. so have you heard of this uh, yeah well actually you know these tests were not designed to give you 100 percent accurate reading um, or the finger prick test. Yeah, it's, for, it's, it's basically to give you a reference. So you need a... So you look at it, if it's highly exaggerated, then you know you go and do a blood test after it. But yep. it's to give you a basic indication of approximately what it's sitting at. Do you but, know, but do you know of any research that's been conducted that if, you know, they do a finger prick test and they squeeze it out, that it could inflate well, it the is, levels? It is a possibility um, because you're coalescing, I mean, uh, you're coagulating whatever... Um, protein in, in that specific area so you can change the physiology of what's happening in there but you know to come back to the la- lady's call she said that uh, cholesterol she cha- she made lifestyle changes and changes in her diet and cholesterol mm-hmm. increase and that's that's the whole point so what because changes who, can you make who, though, who no? advocated those changes um you know we again comes down to what is the right food because we eat what is supposedly the right food and your cholesterol increases it doesn't make sense because we've done tests on people who, who love the fat of meat and their cholesterol is absolutely normal. They have no incidence of heart disease. So they eat the fat on a... So let's take a, a chop. Yeah, right? literally never waste the fat. Uh, if you look at the Eskimos, for, for example, uh, their family, when they kill a walrus, is given at least a kilo of lard each, and they have the lowest incidence of heart disease in the world. So what changes can you make then to what? positively influence your cholesterol levels? Well, why do you need to influence cholesterol levels? That's the question. So this whole thing that we sold, that you need to take statins, and we're going to come to that in a short while, to, you know to help uh, lower your cholesterol levels. What are you saying? Is that just a waste of time? Well, that, that's basically a good to sell a drug. So really, the pharma industry is the one that's benefiting more than my health? Well, somebody had to benefit from that. So it's it's probably worth, you know, billions of dollars 
I think on a global scale in terms of what the statins are producing as as just one little small industry in this whole big pharma game. Well, a few years back with stats we looked at, it said that they made more than 300 million, I mean 300 billion a year globally. Rands or dollars? That's US dollars. Goodness me. So that's a lot of money. That's a lot of bucks. Okay, um, before we move on to the whole statins thing, uh, Jane uh, sent a message to say, good evening doc, uh, I have a pain below my heart. Could it be muscular or heart related? I'm 63. Um, that's a, that's a difficult one to to uh, answer because the pain can be caused by various things. Again, if you sleep in an uncomfortable position, it will cause pains under your your breast line. But then, is this happening chronically? Is it happening on exertion? Is it happening during rest? Well, she just added uh, another line here. It says it's on my back. So I don't know if the pain is when she's lying on Maybe her back. Maybe it's radiating to her back. Yeah. If it is radiating to her back, then it's something that she literally needs to take care of. Okay. Because generally chest pains or that's coming from a cardiac origin would be uh, in the center of the chest, running below the breast line, radiating to the back. Some of it will radiate to the left arm, up the neck and to the lower jaw. So you say she should go and check it out? Just I, I, I would advise that. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the line. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Bali Punan. I had a heart bypass in 2008 and again a valve replacement in 2015. I need to know why is my blood pressure always low and I often have shortness of breath. Is this normal? Okay. That's a good question. Um, so basically you had a bypass first and then the heart valve replaced. Uh, generally speaking, if, if we do a bypass surgery on a patient and there's insufficient or adequate flow to a certain area of the heart, especially where the valves are situated, if the flow around the outside of the area where the valves are situated is insufficient, then the valve leaflets actually start to malfunction with time. So in that case, the valve will have to be replaced later on. There's also other reasons why the valve gets uh, damaged due to um, diseases and stuff like that. So, But generally, we know that if the annulus where the valve is seated is not strong enough, then the valve will need to be replaced sooner or later. Um, her question again. Okay, so let me just quickly go. Sorry, I would uh, moved on uh, from uh, Bali Punan's question. So, um, effectively, uh, Bali wants to know why is uh, the blood pressure always so low? Okay, so you remember we spoke about your blood pressure and which phase of the person's life we're looking at blood pressure. If we take it the initial phase, it'll be normal, then it increases, and then your body actually damages itself literally to bring the blood pressure down in order for you to survive. And that's something interesting I'd like to discuss with you guys as the show progresses. So Hopefully I have the time for that. You mean you could pop a vessel? Actually, your body could do one of two things. It actually damages the heart on its own because it wants to, or it can rupture a blood vessel because it wants to. Okay. Um, Louis writes, uh, Hello, Alan. I'm a cardiac patient. I had a bypass surgery in 2004. My current medication is giving me dry, itchy, scaly, uh, not sure if it is psoriasis on my elbows, knees, and heels. And then he mentions uh, a few of the drugs that he's on, which includes a statin. You think it could be? Uh, well, it, it'll, be unfair, it'll be unfair. It, it probably is drug related if he didn't have it before taking the drugs, but it would be unfair to put that on statins alone. Okay. Uh, very good topic, Mr. Allen. Can't keep it up. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if there's a question. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Allen. Um, thank you. The doctor, my name is Penny. I'm from Phoenix. I'm a cholesterol patient. Cholesterol patient. What, what would be a cholesterol patient, Doc? <laughs> cholesterol I mean, patient. We've, we've, you know, uh, in society today, we've given terms to something and yeah. the entire society just follows it and holds on to okay. it. Yeah, it's like hashtag. I still don't know what that means, you know. All right. But well, I'm just, <laughs> just reading uh, what Penny's written here. So she says she's a cholesterol patient. Uh, she just wants to know uh, what are some of the things that she should eat and Penny has written this in that uh, SMS text speak, so I'm going to have to try and decipher as I go along here. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, she should eat? Uh, she says sometimes she gets chest pains and indigestion uh, when she takes her cholesterol medication. She sometimes also feels good, has a good night's sleep, uh, but after she became a thyroid patient, then she seems to have a cholesterol problem. You see, this is some of the side effects from statins. Uh, it causes gastrointestinal problems. So a lot of them have problems with their, with their bowel movement, uh, with reflux. And this is a common problem with, with statins. Mm. And then we'll have to obviously send them to a doctor to take care of that. Okay. Uh, Bina Ramdari says, my cholesterol was 3.2 last year. This year it went up to 5. My physician put me on 10 milligrams of statin. I'm not diabetic or, she says, hypertensive. 
You mean she's not she's not hypertensive or diabetic? Yeah, she's not diabetic or hypertensive. And what's the age? Uh, she didn't mention her age, but she did say 3.2 last year was the cholesterol level. This year went up to five. She's on a 10 milligram statin. You know, the thing is, a low dose statin has less side effects uh, from what we've noticed with our patients. But then on the same token, you know, we've... And did, 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 did the medical specialist advocate any lifestyle changes before we did that? Did they take multiple samples before we came up with the with the um, solution to control the statin, to control the cholesterol? Because as I said, there's no time in your life that your sugar can be exactly the same or your cholesterol. So we'll have to look at everything in terms of what you ate the day before, what was your activity the day before, what was your activity this morning, how did we take the test, did you really fast for 14 hours? I mean, a simple test like even um, your GFR, which is your kidney function test, most of the patients don't know, or most of the medical professionals don't know how to really take the test. They take it on a fasting. How can you look for waste products on a fasting test? And we see the mistake happens very often. So if this mistake is happening in industry, in one aspect of measuring, then it's happening all the time. Sam Subramani says, hi Alan, what should normal cholesterol levels be? Now we chatted about this, mm -hmm. you just said there's no normal levels. Yeah, there's no normal levels. It's uh, like, it's, I, I think Alan, to put it into perspective, is like, what is the normal height of a person? What should the normal height of a person be? Is there a normal height for a person? It just depends who you're talking about. If you're talking about a pygmy, then the height is different. If you're talking about a Viking, his height will be different. So I don't think there's a normal height for anything. Okay. It's like, what is a normal weight? A normal weight based on what? And on whose opinion, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kathy, uh, I've got your message here, Kathy. Uh, but you just wanted to know... Well, basically, Kathy says, Hello, Doc. Just wanted to know, I have a small on my eyelids. So, I, I can't ask you the question. I don't know. A small what? Right? It could be a mark. It could be a growth. So, Kathy, just get back to us uh, on the uh, WhatsApp line 071. Um, okay. She's already uh, sent it in. She says she has a small pimple on both of her eyelids. Is it related to cholesterol? Have you heard of that? Uh, that's difficult to say. I yeah. think this question is... Without seeing her as well, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um... The WhatsApp line's cooking. I'm going to just, maybe two or three, and then we can still have our discussion. Um, hello, Alan. Hi, Doc. Can statins cause severe twitching and jerking of the muscles, especially in my legs? Yeah, that's, that's one of the side effects of the statin. Uh, it causes muscle problem. Um, one of the biggest problems with it is breaking down of muscle, rhabdomyolysis. Yeah. And the sad, frightening part about it is the, the, the myoglobin that's released from it actually goes to the kidneys and damages the kidneys simultaneously. So muscle twitching, muscle pain, joint pain, breaking down of muscle, loss of weight is very common side effects of the statin. And the US FDA has released a warning regarding that years ago. Mm. Okay, listen, let me take uh, the last WhatsApp question and apologize to you if you've sent up uh, sent us a WhatsApp message. Just far too many to take care of on the WhatsApp line tonight, so sadly I won't be able to do all of that. Uh, but uh, this will be the last one, uh, Doc, for now. Uh, hi, Alan. Hi, Doc. Uh, I am Babs. My cholesterol reading is 4.3. I am diabetic. My doctor had prescribed medication for cholesterol as a preventative measure. I questioned him after reading your article. Uh, not my article, your article, right? <laughs> uh, I do suffer from all the side effects that you mentioned, but he is still persistent. Well, the question is, whose body is it? Uh, I respect the medical profession, and I respect the opinion. But uh, it's still your body at the end of the day. I, I'd like to ask you a simple question. Do you use a plaster if you don't have a cut because your doctor prescribed it? It has to make sense. You know, life should make sense in everything that we do. But certainly, you know, you know the, some parts of the medical fraternity believe statins are going to be good for their patients otherwise they wouldn't be prescribing it right you know <coughs> in terms of the hypocritical no, that's want... true but you know in terms of understanding even our medical profession how does it work um take an engineer and take a doctor for example yeah if you present something to an engineer he'll have to verify if that's true first before he builds a bridge or else that bridge would fall but us as medical professionals, we don't do that. If somebody comes with some stats from a country that's um, first world and they are well spoken and they can sell the product to us, we buy it. And we continue to, I mean, if, I'll give you an example. I presented as a guest speaker at uh, Independent uh, Doctors Forum. And I, uh, this is one of the topics that came up. And at the end, one of the doctors said to me, and he's a very smart guy, um, that, you know, although I respect what you say, I will not stop giving my patients statins left, right, and center. That's, that was his words. And years later, I met a patient of his that said that the doctor said he must never take that statin again. And I said, are you sure it's the same person? He says, yeah, because he took the statin and it caused hells in him. He was paralytic for the next two weeks after he took it. 
And then he said to the patient, never take the tablets again because of the side effects of it. All right. Uh, Pramila, and I did say that was the last, but Pramila seems to be worried about her husband. So since we're talking about heart issues, hi, Alan, my hubby's pulse is currently between 52 and 55. Should I be worried? It depends on what what what, what um, condition the patient is in. Yeah. A patient who's very physically fit, 52 is perfect. A patient who's not and who's having problems, then 52 needs to be taken into consideration. So, it, it, again, what what is a normal heartbeat? What is a normal heart rate? A lot of patients ask me that. But it just depends why the patient's heart rate is increased, decreased, and which stage of their lives it's, it's increased or decreased. So, athlete's heart rate of 52 to 55 is perfect. Right. So let's go back to the question I posed at the very start. In fact, all weekend we've been asking this question on our promo that's been running here on Lotus FM. Is cholesterol the true cause of heart disease? Must answer that in my in my shoes. Well, is, well, well I'm asking for your opinion, now, Doc. Because, <laughs> um, in my opinion, it's it's what's blamed for heart problems. It's what bl- what's blamed for coronary artery disease. So it doesn't cause it. No, it's not the cause. That's my opinion. So what is? Okay, so my research that I've done over these years, one of the things that I've come across in my life is when we lost a patient on bypass surgery, I could never get over it. Um, Because we did everything that we're supposed to do, but the patient passed away. Mm. So we obviously missed something in the the system. So when when that happened, I I really wanted to understand what did we do wrong or what did we miss in order for this to happen to this lady? She was a young lady that came in, left her children um, with a neighbor, came in for a bypass surgery and never made it home at the age of 37. So it was difficult for me at that stage and I always swore to myself that one day I'll find a reason behind it. And I think now, mm. after more than 20 years, I kind of understand why this had happened in the first place. Let's, let's work with analogies, okay? Because it's easy for me. Right. I'll try and be quick. Well, I, okay. I, you know, because mm-hmm. I still want to talk about one or two things. I mean, statins um, still on the table mm-hmm. and I just want to, you know, just something that you're passionate about, external counterpulsation. So let's see what we can do in the next six minutes, right? Okay. So basically speaking, where is cholesterol formed in your body, in your liver, most of it? It's transported in your bloodstream. Your bloodstream is everywhere in your body, am I right? Yeah. So why would cholesterol store in your heart? You remember I asked you before, would it store in something that moves the most or moves the least? Moves the least. Moves the least. Yeah. But the heart moves the most. Moving all the time. Yeah, so why would you want to store there? If you were cholesterol, you would want to store on something that's not moving. Not something that's moving completely or all the time. But cholesterol stores in the heart almost always and almost f- as a first place that it is stored. So why is this happening? This is because of flow dynamics. It has nothing to do with the level of cholesterol. Let's take living on the East Coast, okay? We live next to the ocean. I'm sure all the listeners and yourself is familiar with muscle. Muscles grow on rock. I think, yeah, yeah, okay. That, okay, that type of muscle. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Does it grow in the deep sea? No. Does it grow in sea sand? Where the water covers no. the sand? No. It no. grows on the rocks. Yeah. Why? Because there's a high pressure from the inside carried through the waves, and there's a high back pressure from the shoreline. The area of turbulent flow is around the area where the rocks are situated. The area of turbulent flow does two things. One, it creates an area of stasis. What's that? where something would spin around and stay in the same place. Okay, so like a helicopter hovers there. Yeah, like a whirlpool literally. Okay. okay? And two, it would cause damage to the rock surface, am I right? Probably. Because it's turbulent flow. Yeah, yeah. Those two things are the perfect environment for muscles to store. One, because whatever small muscles are there will attach itself to the surface of the rock, which has now been damaged sufficiently and rough enough for it mm-hmm. to stick. So this is why it forms in the place it forms, because of turbulent flow. The question is, if we take the muscles, you and I, if we could pick up a million muscles a day and plant it in the deep sea, stick it into the rocks somehow, would it grow? Probably not. And if we take it and plant it on the sand, would it grow? Probably not. So, basically we are saying that no matter how much you control the muscle, it will not dictate where it stores. Am I right? Well, it makes sense. So, similarly, no matter how much you control the cholesterol, it's still going to store in the same place that it's doing at the moment. So controlling the cholesterol will not in any way dictate where it's going to store. So what do you need to do then? What you need to do is you need to identify the flow dynamics. You need to identify if there's high pressure and there's high back pressure and if there's turbulent flow. That's where external counterpulsation comes in. That's where actually three-dimensional vascular graphy comes in. Which is the other thing that you're famous for. Which is the other thing. So basically three-dimensional vascular graphy can look at your vascular compliance, look at your heart, look at your blood pressure, look at your stroke volume, your cardiac output, your firing mechanism of your heart and identify what's happening in your body in order to put corrective systems in place. Another thing that we use 
to to uh, explain this is basically a car the analogy of a car. If you had to take a blood pressure device and attach it to the center of the exhaust system, the engine would fire and, you, and when the car is new, there's a certain amount of pressure in the exhaust system. If for some reason we narrow the exhaust system, it'll back pressure the engine. The engine would weaken. If the engine weakens, the rings and bearings would break, you would repair it, you'll still have a car that's dysfunctional. But another thing that could happen is the blood, uh, the exhaust system can rupture at its weakest points and that, that probably what happened to uh, Mr. Ferguson unfortunately so there's one of two things that can happen and why does it happen to create equilibrium because if the engine wears out then the amount of pressure that's coming out of the exhaust will reduce mm -hmm. and because the back pressure would reduce the engine would last and if the exhaust system pops and the pressure is reduced then the entire car would still be functional now the exact same things happen in a human being basically what happens is your heart and, and this is what we have now discovered using three-dimensional vascular uh, vasculography and it'll be the first time that I, I divulge this to anybody that we've now I think we've put coronary artery disease into perspective and what happens is literally your heart empties out blood there's a blood pressure that's created during this phase your heart empties out the blood mm -hmm. right by pumping literally okay it creates a pressure your blood vessels throughout your body were supposed to expand and contract that's how it was made. Mm. It releases even a gas called nitric oxide that's released on each time your heart beats. And there's hormones that go and cause a constriction again. As a patient gets older because of inflammation, smoking, poor eating habits, genetic factors, loss of exercise and stuff like that, you lose the elasticity of your blood vessels. When your elasticity of your blood vessels is blocked, it causes a back pressure on the heart, causing what we call the systolic pressure to increase. When the systolic pressure increases, after time, the diastolic pressure will increase. When the diastolic pressure increases, the amount of blood flow entering the coronary arteries would increase. Sorry, I'm going a little bit deep into this. And when that happens, basically, those are the small arteries you see in the picture of the heart. When the pressure is there, it back pressures the system because the small arteries can only take a certain volume. You've increased the volume. Now we're creating the same scenario like what happens in the ocean. And that back pressure causes turbulent flow in the middle of the artery. And that turbulent flow actually damages, causes inflammation, damages the artery. White blood cells then go there. It's an inflammatory response that occurs. Cholesterol is then called to the, excuse me, cholesterol is then called to the site. And cholesterol stores in the site as a repertory mechanism. Does it create a blockage? Well, it will cause a blockage with time. But it's meant to do that. Because if the vascular compliance remains poor, it will eventually damage the heart. So what the heart does is literally, the brain does, literally damages the heart itself. Because when the heart starts to get damaged, the amount of blood coming out of the heart will decrease. So how do we solve this in a minute? Well, basically, in a minute, you need to identify at an early stage using things like three-dimensional vasculography right. to identify the physiological changes that's happening in the body. Should we find the physiological changes have, have, uh, have a negative impact on the body, then we should put systems in place early to ensure that the patient doesn't have a heart attack. It would be great if we could do this this on, on a picture or on a, something that's, yeah. uh, that a patient can visual, visualize. Or radio state of the mind, right? So yeah, I think you're building so they up create their own yeah, impression yeah. in their mind. Totally, totally. You're building up quite a nice picture. Now listen, um, with your permission, we'll have to get you back sooner rather than later. We hadn't touched into uh, you know, things on statins, external counterpulsation, and uh, judging by the questions on uh, my WhatsApp line on the screen in front of me, it's just far too many questions for me to go through tonight. So, uh, Soma has just sent one. Hi, Alan. Brilliant show. Brilliant doctor. Thank you, Soms. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. You have a fan there. Thank you, Soma, for that. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohanlal, always a privilege and a pleasure. So, uh, once again, just, just so that I'm, 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 you know, spot on with this. Is cholesterol the true cause of heart disease? In my opinion, no. And that's where we leave it. Uh, we'll get you back in a month. How's <laughs> Thank it? Is, you. Is that all right? <laughs> that's fine. Okay, if you've been fascinated with Dr. Mohan Lal, maybe you want to continue the conversation with him. Uh, there's uh, three ways you can reach him. Uh, one is on the phone number I'm about to give you. The second, you can go to his website. The third is his uh, an email address. So here we go. Uh, you can dial him on 031-566-5617. That's 031 Five six six five six one seven, or go online to www.counterpulsation.co.za. That's www.counterpulsation.co.za, or you can email uh, reception at counterpulsation.coza. That's reception 
at counterpulsation.co.za or you can pick up the phone and dial them tomorrow morning on 031-566-5617. It's a minute after eight. That's my lot tonight on Medical Monday. And my thanks to Maya Jagjeevan Kalicharan who produced tonight's show. My thanks to Dr. Mohanlal for giving us his time and expert opinion. Tracy Valitham standing by. She's got your last and final news bulletin off this Monday night. Uh, Lloyd Paul, 100% local between now and 10 o'clock. You take it nice and easy. If you're out and about on the roads, please drive safely. God willing, I'll talk to you again uh, if all goes according to plan uh, on Thursday on our pre-Mother's Day concert from M1 Studio with the brilliant Natalie Rungan. Uh, Maya Jagjeevan is taking care of the show tomorrow and Wednesday. I'll be back again, as I said, God willing, on Thursday. Have a wonderful week. I'm Alan Khan reminding you that the beauty about life is that you and I have the ability to help others. So please be good and do good.